Today we'll be reading some actual history from this book, Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians by Fanny Kelly. This book was published all the way back in 1871. So in today's episode, Fanny Kelly is going to meet a woman who was captured by the Sioux Indians in the Minnesota outbreak of 1862. This was the same outbreak that Lavina Eastlick wrote an account of that we read in the last episode in this series. The other woman captive that Fanny Kelly meets was not from Lake Chatek, where Lavina Eastlick was from, but she had been taken into the Sioux country along with some of the captives from Lake Chatek, Mrs. Wright and Mrs. Dooley. So in this episode, we'll see how the story of the Minnesota outbreak of 1862 intersects with Fanny Kelly's captivity two years later. It was about this time that I had the sorrowful satisfaction of meeting with a victim of Indian cruelty, whose fate was even sadder than mine. It was a part of my labor to carry water from the stream at which we camped, and, awakened for that purpose, I arose, and hurried out one morning before the day had yet dawned clearly, leaving the Indians still in their blankets, and the village very quiet. In the woods beyond I heard the retiring howl of the wolf, the shrill shriek of the bird of prey, as it was sweeping down on the unburied carcass of some poor murdered traveler, and the desolation of my life and its surroundings filled my heart with dread and gloom. I was so reduced in strength and spirit that nothing but the dread of the scalping knife urged my feet from task to task, and now, returning toward the teepee, with my heavy bucket I started to behold a fair-faced, beautiful young girl sitting there, dejected and worn like myself, but bearing the marks of loveliness and refinement despite her neglected covering. Almost doubting my reason, for I had become unsettled in my self-reliance and even sanity, I feared to address her, but stood spellbound gazing in her sad brown eyes and drooping pallid face. The chief stood near the entrance of the teepee enjoying the cool morning air and watching the interview with amusement. He offered me a book which chanced to be one of the Wilson's readers stolen from our wagons and bade me show it to the stranger. I approached the girl who instantly held out her hand and said, What book is that? The sound of my own language spoken by one of my own people was too much for me, and I sank to the ground by the side of the stranger and, endeavoring to clasp her in my arms, became insensible. A kindly squaw who was in sight must have been touched by our helpless sorrow, for when recovering she was sprinkling my face with water from the bucket and regarding me with looks of interest. Of course, we realized that this chance interview would be short, and perhaps the last that we would be able to enjoy, and while my companion covered her face and wept, I told my name and the main incidents of my capture, and I dreaded to recall the possible fate of my Mary, lest I should rouse the terrible feelings I was trying to keep in subjection as my only hope of preserving reason. The young girl responded to my confidence by giving her own story, which she related as follows. My name is Mary Boyeau. These people call me Maddie. I have been among them since the massacre in Minnesota, and am now in my sixteenth year. My parents were of French descent, but we lived in the state of New York until my father, in pursuance of his peculiar passion for the life of a naturalist and a man of science, sold our eastern home and came to live on the shores of Spirit Lake, Minnesota. The Indians had watched about our place and regarded what they had seen of my father's chemical apparatus with awe and fear. Perhaps they suspected him of working evil charms in his laboratory, or held as magnets, microscopes, and curiously shaped tubes in superstitious aversion. I cannot tell, I only know that we were among the first victims of the massacre, and that all my family were murdered except myself and, I fear, one younger sister. You fear, said I. Do you not hope that she escaped? The poor girl shook her head. From a life like mine, death is an escape, she said bitterly. Oh, it is fearful and a sin to rush unbidden into God's presence, but I cannot live through another frightful winter. No, I must and will die if no relief comes to me. For a year these people regarded me as a child, and then a young man of their tribe gave a horse for me and carried me to his teepee as his wife. 
Do you love your husband? I asked. A look, bitter and revengeful, gleamed from her eyes. Love a savage who bought me to be a drudge and slave, she repeated. No, I hate him as I hate all that belong to this fearful bondage. He has another wife and child, thank God, she added with a shudder, that I am not a mother. Misery and the consciousness of her own degraded life seem to have made this poor young creature desperate, and looking at her toil-worn hands and scarred arms, I saw the signs of abuse and cruelty. Her feet, too, were bare, and fearfully bruised and travel-marked. Does he ill-treat you? I inquired. His wife does, she answered. I am forced to do all manner of slavish work, and when my strength fails, I am urged on by blows. Oh, I do so fearfully dread the chilling winters, without proper food or clothing, and I long to lie down and die, if God's mercy will only permit me to escape from this hopeless imprisonment. I have nothing to expect now. I did once look forward to release, but that is all gone. I strove to go with the others who were ransomed at Fort Pierre, and Mrs. Wright pled for me with all her heart, but the man who bought me would not give me up, and my prayers were useless. Mr. Dupay, a Frenchman who brought a wagon for the redeemed women and children, did not offer enough for me, and when another man offered a horse, my captor would not receive it. There were many prisoners that I did not see in the village, but I am left alone. The Yanktons, who hold me, are friendly by pretense, and go to the agencies for supplies and annuities, but at heart they are bitterly hostile. They assert that if they did not murder and steal, the father at Washington would forget them, and now they receive presents and supplies to keep them in check, which they delight in taking, and deceiving the officers as of their share in the outbreaks. Her dread of soldiers was such that she had never attempted to escape, nor did she seem to think it possible to get away from her present life. So deep was the despair into which long-continued suffering had plunged her. Sad as my condition was, I could not but pity poor Mary's worse fate, the unwilling wife of a brutal savage, and subject to all the petty malice of a scarcely less brutal squaw. There could be no gleam of sunshine in her future prospects. True, I was, like her, a captive, torn from home and friends, and subject to harsh treatment, but no such personal indignity has fallen to my lot. When Mary was first taken, she saw many terrible things which she related to me, among which was the following. One day the Indians went into a house where they found a woman making bread. Her infant child lay in the cradle, unconscious of its fate. Snatching it from its little bed, they thrust it into the heated oven, its screams torturing the wretched mother, who was immediately after stabbed and cut into many pieces. Taking the suffering little creature from the oven, they then dashed out its brains against the walls of the house. One day on their journey, they came to a narrow but deep stream of water. Some of the prisoners and nearly all of the Indians crossed on horseback, while a few crossed on logs, which had been cut down by the beaver. A lady, whose name was Mrs. Fletcher, I believe, who was in delicate health, fell into the water with her heavy burden, unable on account of her condition to cross, and was shot by the Indians. Her lifeless body soon disappeared from sight. She also told me of a white man having been killed a few days previous, and a large sum of money taken from him, which would be exchanged for articles used among the Indians when they next visited the Red River or British possessions. They went, she told me, two or three times a year, taking American horses, valuables, etc., which they had stolen from the whites, and exchanging them for ammunition, powder, arrow points, and provisions. Before they reached the Missouri River, they killed five of Mrs. Dooley's children, one of which was left on the ground in a place where the distracted mother had to pass daily in carrying water from the river, and when they left the camp, the body remained unburied. So terrible were the sufferings of this heartbroken mother that when she arrived in safety among the whites, her reason was dethroned, and I was told that she was sent to the lunatic asylum, where her distracted husband soon followed. Mary wished that we might be together, but knew that it would be useless to ask, as it would not be granted. I gave her my little book and half of my pencil, which she was glad to receive. 
I wrote her name in the book together with mine, encouraging her with every kind word and hope of the future. She could read and write, and understood the Indian language thoroughly. The book had been taken from our wagon, and I had endeavored to teach the Indians from it, for it contained several stories, so it made the Indians very angry to have me part with it. For hours I had sat with the book in my hands, showing them the pictures and explaining their meaning, which interested them greatly, and which helped pass away and relieve the monotony of the days of captivity which I was enduring. Moreover, it inspired them with a degree of respect and veneration for me when engaged in the task, which was not only pleasant, but a great comfort. It was by this means that they discovered my usefulness in writing letters and reading for them. I found them apt pupils, willing to learn, and they learned easily and rapidly. Their memory is very retentive, unusually good. One day, as I was pursuing what seemed to me an endless journey, an Indian rode up beside me, whom I did not remember to have seen before. At his saddle hung a bright and well-known little shawl, and from the other side was suspended a child's scalp of long, fair hair. As my eyes rested on the frightful sight, I trembled in my saddle and grasped the air for support. A blood-red cloud seemed to come between me and the outer world, and I realized that innocent victim's dying agonies. The torture was too great to be endured. A merciful insensibility interposed between me and madness. I dropped from the saddle as if dead and rolled upon the ground at the horse's feet. When I recovered, I was clinging to a squaw who, with looks of astonishment and alarm, was vainly endeavoring to extricate herself from my clutches. With returning consciousness, I raised my eyes to the fearful sight that had almost deprived me of reason. It was gone. The Indian had suspected the cause of my emotion and removed it out of sight. They placed me in the saddle once more, and not being able to control the horrible misery I felt, I protested wildly against their touch, imploring them to kill me, and frantically inviting the death I had before feared and avoided. When they camped, I had not the power or reason to seek my own tent, but fell down in the sun, where the chief found me lying. He had been out at the head of a scouting party, and knew nothing of my sufferings, Instantly approaching me, he inquired who had misused me. I replied, No one. I want to see my dear mother, my poor mother who loves me and pines for her unhappy child. I had found by experience that the only grief with which this red nation had any sympathy was the sorrow one might feel for a separation from a mother, and even the chief seemed to recognize the propriety of such emotion. On this account I feigned to be grieving solely for my dear widowed mother, and was treated with more consideration than I had dared to expect. Leaving me for a few moments, he then returned, bringing me some ripe wild plums which were deliciously cooling to my fever-parched lips. Hunger and thirst, sorrow and fear with unusual fatigue and labor had weakened me in mind and body, so that after trying to realize the frightful vision that had almost deprived me of my senses, I began to waver in my knowledge of it. And I half determined that it was a hideous phantom like many another that had tortured my lonely hours. I tried to dismiss this awful dream from remembrance, particularly as the days that followed found me ill and delirious, and it was some time before I was able to recall events clearly. About this time there was another battle, and many having already sank under the united misery of hunger and fatigue, the camp was gloomy and hopeless in the extreme. The Indians discovered my skill in dressing wounds, and I was called immediately to the relief of the wounded brought into camp. The fight had lasted three days, and from the immoderate lamentations, I suppose that many had fallen, but could form no idea of the loss. Except when encamped for rest, the tribe pursued their wanderings constantly, sometimes flying before the enemy at others endeavoring to elude them. 
I kept the record of time as it passed with the Indians as well as I was able, and with the exception of a few days lost during temporary delirium and fever at two separate times, and which I endeavored to supply by careful inquiry, I miss no count of the rising or setting sun, and new dates almost as well as if I had been in the heart of civilization. One very hot day a dark cloud seemed suddenly to pass before the sun, and threaten a great storm. The wind rose and the cloud became still darker, until the light of day was almost obscured. A few drops sprinkled the earth, and then, in a heavy, blinding, and apparently inexhaustible shower, fell a countless swarm of grasshoppers, covering everything and rendering the air almost black by their descent. It is impossible to convey an idea of their extent. They seem to rival Pharaoh's locusts in number, and no doubt would have done damage to the food of the Indians had they not fallen victims themselves of their keen appetites. To catch them, large holes are dug in the ground, which are heated by fires. Into these apertures the insects are then driven, and the fires having been removed, the heated earth bakes them. They are considered good food, and were greedily devoured by the famishing Sioux. Although the grasshoppers only remained two days, and went as suddenly as they had come, the Indians seemed refreshed by their feasting on such small game, and continued to move forward. Halting one day to rest beside good water, I busily engaged myself in the chief's teepee or lodge. I had grown so weak that motion of any kind was exhausting to me, and I could scarcely walk. I felt that I must soon die of starvation and sorrow, and life had ceased to be dear to me. Mechanically, I tried to fulfill my tasks, so as to secure the continued protection of the old squaw, who, when not incensed by passion, was not devoid of kindness. My strength failed me, and I could not carry out my wishes, and almost fell as I tried to move around. This met with disapprobation, and, better fed than myself, she could not sympathize with my want of strength. She became cross and left the lodge, threatening me with her vengeance. Presently, an Indian woman who pitied me ran into the teepee in great haste, saying that her husband had got some deer meat, and she had cooked it for a feast, and she begged me to share it. As she spoke, she drew me toward her tent, and hungry and fainting, I readily followed. The chief saw us go, and, not disdaining a good dinner, he followed. The old squaw came flying into the lodge like an enraged fury, flourishing her knife and vowing she would kill me. I arose immediately and fled, the squaw pursuing me. The chief attempted to interfere, but her rage was too great, and he struck her, at which she sprang like an infuriated tiger upon him, stabbing him in several places. Her brother, who at a short distance beheld the fray, and deeming me the cause, fired six shots determining to kill me. One of these shots lodged in the arm of the chief, breaking it near the shoulder. I then ran until I reached the outskirts of the village, where I was captured by a party who saw me running, but who knew not the cause. Thinking that I was endeavoring to escape, they dragged me in the tent, brandishing their tomahawks and threatening vengeance. After the lapse of half an hour, some squaws came and took me back to the lodge of the chief who was waiting for me before his wounds could be dressed. He was very weak from loss of blood. I never saw the wife of the chief afterward. Indian surgery is coarse and rude in its details. A doctor of the tribe had pierced the arm of the chief with a long knife, probing in search of the ball that it had received, and the wound thus enlarged had to be healed. As soon as I was able to stand, I was required to go and wait on the disabled chief. I found his three sisters with him, and with these I continued to live in companionship. One of them had been married at the fort to a white man, whom she had left at Laramie when his prior wife arrived. She told me that they were esteemed to be friendly, and had often received supplies from the fort, although at heart they were always the enemy of the white man. 
But will they not suspect you, I asked? They may discover your deceit and punish you some day. She laughed derisively. Our prisoners don't escape to tell tales, she replied. Dead people don't talk. We claim friendship and they cannot prove that we don't feel it. Besides, all white soldiers are cowards. Shudderingly, I turned away from this enemy of my race, and prepared to wait on my captor, whose superstitious belief in the healing power of a white woman's touch led him to desire her services. The wounds of the chief were severe, and the suppuration profuse. It was my task to bathe and dress them, and prepare his food. Hunting and fishing being now out of the question for him, he had sent his wives to work for themselves, keeping the sisters and myself to attend him. War with our soldiers seemed to have decreased the power of the chief to a great extent. As he lay ill, he evidently meditated on some plan of strengthening his forces, and finally concluded to send an offer of marriage to the daughter of a war chief of another band. As General Sully's destructive attack had deprived him of all ready offerings, he availed himself of my shoes, which happened to be particularly good, and reducing me to moccasins sent them as a gift to his expected bride. She evidently received them graciously, for she came to his lodge almost every day to visit him, and sat chatting at his side to his apparent satisfaction. The pleasure of this new matrimonial acquisition on the part of the chief was very trying to me, on account of my limited wardrobe, for as the betrothed continued in favor, the chief evinced it by giving her articles of my clothing. An Indian woman had given me a red silk sash such as officers wear. The chief unceremoniously cut it in half, leaving me one half, while the coquettish squaw received the rest. An Indian's husband's power is absolute even to death. No woman can have more than one husband, but an Indian man can have as many wives as he chooses. The marriage of the chief was to be celebrated with all due ceremony when his arm got well. But his arm never recovered. Mr. Clemens, the interpreter, tells me, in my late interview with him, that he still remains crippled and unable to carry out his murderous intentions, or any of his anticipated wicked designs. He is now living in the forts along the Missouri River, gladly claiming support from the government. So that's the end of our reading from Fanny Kelly's narrative for this episode. She met this other white woman, Mary Boyeau, who had been taken captive from Spirit Lake, Minnesota. We also learned about the final end of the chief's marriage to the squaw, who had become angry and violent before, and the chief's marriage to his new wife. One interesting thing about this story is that there appears to be no record of Mary Boyeau outside of Fanny Kelly's narrative. It is possible that no record exists simply because she lived in a very sparsely settled area of Minnesota, and nearly all of her family and neighbors had been killed, so there was no one to look for her or tell her story. Mary Boyeau is said to be from Spirit Lake, Minnesota, and Spirit Lake is better known for an earlier massacre that occurred in 1857 than it is for the much more widespread massacre in Minnesota in 1862. However, as I will read later, there is also documentation that the Spirit Lake community was massacred again in 1862, but first I want to read something arguing for the possibility that Mary Boyeau was made up by Fanny Kelly. This comes from a recent thesis published in 2022 by a history student named Jordan Redinger, who speculates that Fanny Kelly may have made up the story of Mary Boyeau as a way to tell about her own feelings about being forced to be the wife of Chief Ottawa. One issue with this theory is that Dr. Redinger appears to have been unaware that Spirit Lake was massacred again in 1862. This is the section from that thesis. Boyeau's sentiments should be examined within the context that she was married to her rapist. Another possibility could be that Kelly made up Boyeau as a way of expressing her own sentiments on being Chief Ottawa's wife. Boyeau may have been Kelly's way of talking about the trauma without admitting to rape. 
Additionally, Kelly claimed Boyeau had been taken during the Spirit Lake Massacre of 1857 and that she met Boyeau a year later. Kelly was taken in 1864, however. There is no reference to her in Sharp's narrative, nor is she listed on the memorial to the victims and captives. There is a possibility that Kelly fictionalized the incident or claimed Boyeau had connections to an event which much of the public had been aware of. So that is the theory that Fanny Kelly made up Mary Boyeau. However, part of the reasoning is that Boyeau was part of the 1857 massacre, not the 1862 massacre, and this wouldn't have added up in Fanny Kelly's story. Another piece of evidence countering this theory is that Mary Boyeau was linked to the Lake Chatek massacre, which Lavina Eastlick was a victim of. In her story, Mary Boyeau refers to almost getting released along with Mrs. Wright, and she also refers to Mrs. Dooley who lost all but one of her children. An account of Mrs. Wright's and Mrs. Dooley's release is given in the 1863 book A History of the Great Massacre by the Sioux Indians in Minnesota by Charles Bryant and Abel Murch. This was the book in which Lavina Eastlick's account was first published. It provides this short account of their captivity. Mrs. Julia A. Wright, Mrs. Coke, and Mrs. Dooley, and the two children of Mrs. Wright, and the two children of Mrs. Dooley were taken captive. One of the children of Mrs. Wright was found at Camp Release, but Mrs. Dooley, Mrs. Wright, and the rest of their children were taken by followers of Little Crow to the Missouri River and were subsequently ransomed at Fort Pierre by Major Galpin. So if Fanny Kelly made the story about Mary Boyeau up, she did well to have it align with the story of the captives of the Lake Chatek massacre. In Fanny's story, Mary Boyeau was not allowed to go with Mrs. Wright because her new husband demanded she stay. On the very next page of this book, A History of the Great Massacre by the Sioux Indians in Minnesota, it provides an account of the Spirit Lake Massacre of 1862, which occurred on August 25th, about five days after the Lake Chatek Massacre. On or about the 25th day of August, the Annuity Sioux Indians made their appearance at Spirit Lake, the scene of the terrible Inkpaduta Massacre of 1857. This lake is situated upon the extreme southern border of the state, the south half of the lake being in Iowa. The north end is in the county of Jackson, Minnesota. They massacred in this county, as near as can be ascertained, 13 persons. The inhabitants fled in dismay from their homes, and the Indians, after plundering the dwellings of the settlers, completed their fiendish work by setting fire to the country in the early part of September. Many of the people were hiding in the sloughs and ravines, and as the desolating prairie fires lighted by Indian hands swept over the plains, devouring every living thing along its burning track, numbers of these wanderers fell victims to its destroying march, and their charred and blackened remains, subsequently found, told a sad story of their awful death. Among the victims of the Indian torch was a woman, the third wife of a Norwegian named Olesen. All of his wives met a tragic end. The first wife fell down a mountainside in Norway and was killed. The second wife committed suicide by drowning in Wisconsin, and the third was consumed in this fire at Spirit Lake. In this, as in all other portions of the state visited by these monsters, the destruction of property was almost total and complete. Of a population of 300, not one was left in the whole county. So all of this seems to make the story that Fanny Kelly told about meeting Mary Boyeau at least plausible. There is a record that Spirit Lake was massacred not only in 1857, but also in 1862, which aligns with Fanny Kelly's story. What seems to have happened is that Mrs. Wright, Mary Boyeau, and other captives from the 1862 outbreak in Minnesota were taken to the Upper Sioux Agency on the Minnesota River, and then taken further west along the Missouri River into Indian Territory. Of course, it's also possible that Fanny Kelly simply made this story up, but if she did, she did a good job of integrating it with other accounts like that of Lavina Eastlick and Mrs. Wright. 
This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is unworthy of history channels on TV, and because we are unworthy to stand in the shoes of some of the people we talk about on this channel. In future episodes, we'll cover more actual history on the captivity of Fanny Kelly, as well as other victims of the 1862 Minnesota Massacre, like Mrs. Wright, Mrs. Dooley, and others. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.